from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Ahead for you today, K-State's Craig Rosabone will talk about selecting a cover crop for planting this fall as a forage resource or for long-term soil improvement. He'll look at the growth characteristics of several grasses, legumes, and brassicas and the forage production expectations for each. And Craig will go over the agronomic management requirements for cover crop establishment. Also, K-State's Jakob Zariesis will talk about a U.S. Agency for International Development project he's engaged in now, which is tracking the food needs of impoverished families in the African country of Ghana as part of the large-scale Feed the Future initiative. And later on with Stop, Look, and Listen, K-State's Gus Vanderhoeven. All that here on Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. We're glad to have you along for this midweek edition of Agriculture Today. Here we are pushing into the mid part of August now. And for those of you producers who are entertaining the idea of planting a cover crop this fall, a cool season crop, we've several considerations for you right here on this part of the broadcast. Along our way once again is a cropping systems agronomist here at K-State, Craig Rosabone, to go over a whole assortment of things to consider if one is, in fact, inclined toward planting a cover crop here this fall, Craig. But there still seems to be appreciating momentum behind the idea of cover crops in Kansas. Is that your sense of it? That's right. I think they're, they're gaining in popularity, uh, and it's moved more and more into the mainstream. And probably the largest group of producers who are planting cover crops are utilizing them for forage one way or another, typically grazing. And that's the way to capture some value from these things, to get your money back out of the expense of the seeding and the planting and operation. Some producers plant them purely for the uh, benefits to the soil, mm-hmm. to maintain cover, and that's a, a valuable part of rotations as well. You can meet multiple objectives with a cover crop. That's what you're leading to here. That's right, and there's no one-size-fits-all by mm-hmm. any stretch of the imagination. Uh, there are a number of options where you land on, how you manage it, what species you plant, whether or not you plant a mixture or a single species, all of those depend on what you're going after. Well, let's talk about some of the prime candidates as cool season cover crops that would be planted here very soon and align those with the objectives that one might be interested in here. Uh, This could really extend quite a ways, couldn't it? That's right. And as you mentioned, we're moving into that period where we start thinking about planting the cool season species. Mm -hmm. It's probably not too late to include a warm season component, say in a mixture, or even uh, some warm season cover crops. We could probably get, you know, 60 plus days of decent growth on some of those. But for something that's going to persist into the fall, you probably want to think about at least having some cool season components. And Mm -hmm. so when we're talking about cool season Species, uh, small grains, spring oats are a good option. Spring wheat, winter wheat, triticale is often a good option. And the benefit of most of those is, especially if you're talking about the spring versions, is that you can plant them now and they might head, but likely not. And especially if you graze them, you'll keep them in a vegetative state. And when you get into the winter hard freezes, and it it takes a good hard freeze in the low to mid-20s to kill these things, then they're terminated, and you don't have to have a chemical termination or anything else. And so depending on how you manage them, you then have some ground cover for the winter, and and you're set up nicely for a no-till seed bed in the spring. The small grains are nice 
in that they tend to produce a little more persistent residue. They have a higher CDN ratio. You plant the spring species now. As I said, they're not likely to head because many of them have a day length component. You've got to have days getting longer to stimulate that head formation where obviously we're not quite in that uh, situation now. Mm -hmm. So the spring small grains are are a nice way to go. Add to that then some other typically spring planted species like turnips or rapeseed or radishes those kinds of things, they have kind of that similar life cycle in terms of likely staying vegetative through the fall, especially if you graze them a little bit to remove leaf area, keep them from bolting. And they provide very high quality feed, very high protein, high energy. As a matter of fact, if you have these brassicas, the radishes, turnips, etc., you probably need to have If it's not in the mix itself, and even if there are some small grains, have some dry hay available for the the roughage component of it. As a buffer, basically. Exactly. It's very high energy. It's not really a forage or a a roughage component of your your, uh, grazing ration. Uh, The thing about uh, many of these, like the brassicas especially, once they kind of get past that initial seedling phase, they put on some some decent growth. And so you could plant it here in uh, early to mid-August, get a ton or two or more of dry matter production out of these things. And depending on how you... You graze it, some decent cattle gains. Those are a nice way to utilize, a, say, if you've had, you're going into wheat stubble. would be a typical scenario that you've got ground that you can put this on. Keeping them grazed or uh, getting a good canopy of these things out there can do a nice job of suppressing these fall emerging weeds. Mayor's tail comes up in the fall. If you've got a good canopy established of these brassicas or the small grain, uh, we've got data that indicates you can inhibit or at least slow down those uh, fall emerging mare's tail and make it easier to control them then early next spring. Which is a very important component unto itself. Back to predicting the tonnage, one to two ton per acre, is that somewhat standard over the brassicas as well as the small grains? I think the brassicas are a little hard to predict, but if you can get them established and growing, yes, Mm -hmm. you can get a couple of tons of growth at this point. And depending on how winter hardy, some species are, takes a harder freeze to kill than others and and, uh, how the fall shapes up. But yeah, a ton per acre or up to to two tons, uh, we've had situations even surpassing that with some of these plantings. And and we can continue planting those into early to mid-September. Obviously, the production potential drops, but there's still time to put on uh, decent growth and, and have some either grazing utilization or just accumulate top growth as a straight-up cover crop. But with any of these options, that planting window does close out here sometime in the middle part of September or so? Actually, we've drilled some uh, small grains after soybean harvest in October. Okay. Think about wheat planting, right? We're planting winter wheat in uh, October, even early November sometimes. And so if you transition to a winter triticale or winter wheat can be used as a cover crop in that situation, or even you could call it a flex crop in which you may harvest it for grain or you may terminate it or something. In that case, you won't get any fall utilization, right, and most of the growth. And even the emergence, the later you go, some of the emergence may be in the winter or spring. And so you don't have as much fall cover, but it can be done. Even some of the shorter season corn will be coming off here later in August and into September. There's time to get some covers in after corn harvest, Uh, no-till into that corn stubble. And again, much depends on what your plans are next year for this ground, right, mm-hmm. and and how you manage it. If you don't graze it and you have a small grain in there, you develop a high amount of biomass. You may think about going to a soybean crop, say, instead of uh, trying to get an early corn crop on that ground. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you've got a brassica or a brassica mixture heavy in brassicas or other legumes, you've got winter pea field pea, 
some of the clovers can be planted now and get some nice fall growth and early spring growth. If you have more of those elements in there, right, you can transition to, say, a corn or sorghum. Sorghum gives you the option of letting it go further into the spring, especially with the winter legumes. Most of those are slower to establish in the fall and more of the growth and potential nitrogen fixation occurs in the spring, actually. That's the nice part about cover crops and your various selections here. You can customize to your needs, in essence, whether it be for soil building, whether it be for forage production, so forth. Exactly. And and the retailers have kind of suggested mixes or recommended mixtures depending on what your goals are and where you fit in the rotation, whether you're going to graze it. There's also, you can think about pollinator habitat. You can think about habitat for beneficial insects, those kinds of things, and to maintain those insect populations that are desirable to control some of the insect pests. And so a lot of different things going on, and they can provide some recommendations, and most of the suppliers will provide custom mixes to your specifications as well. But there's a fair amount of compatibility with most all of these cover crop options, it sounds anyway. That's true. You can mix about anything. But some things tend to go well together, turnips or other cool season brassicas and spring small grains Mm -hmm. make a nice persistent fall mixture. But again, if you wanted to put in a warm season component, that might work. It'll just maybe slow down or, or make less of a stand of some of those cool season components. How does one come to the conclusion of what mixture will work best for them? That's a difficult question to answer because of the infinite number of (laughs) potential variations that you're dealing with. And so, again, as with individual species, with mixtures, it still depends on what your goals are for the cover crop. Are you going to graze it or is it just a straight-up cover? The timing of when you plant, when it will be terminated... If you want to plant now and expect frost to terminate it, you want to stick to more of the spring species. Do you want the residue to be more persistent? Well, then you want more of the small grains. If you want it to be less persistent, maybe you're transitioning to a corn crop or another sorghum crop next spring. Then you want more of the brassicas or the clovers or peas in there. If uh, you're going to graze it heavily, maybe you want a summer crop in there and you're able to plant fairly soon. You could have some fast-growing sorghum sedan, those kinds of things in there, graze it, and then some of the cool season crops may be able to come up through that and survive further into the winter to extend that grazing period, provide some fall cover as well. Mm -hmm. And so you can mix warm and cool season species together. And so that all plays into it, you know. Are you going for animal production, straight-up cover? How persistent do you want the residue to be? Palatability comes into play. Some species are are more acceptable to animals than others. Uh, What's the protein content? Those kinds of things. Well, then what does a producer really, truly need to key in on in as far as generally now, stand establishment for cover crops, seeding rates, fertility, what? I think uh, a number of things come into play in terms of getting a good stand of the cover crop. Most of the time, uh, we're looking at no-till establishment. So you have to have the weeds burned down. So the weed control element is important. And the more complex the mix, the less likely you are to have herbicide options available to you, right? So it's Watch a, that. <laughs> yes, right. So it's a straight-up burn down. You also have to keep, as you implied in mind, what previous herbicide applications have been made and what potential there is for carryover because some of these brassicas and even some of the small grains are fairly sensitive to some of the previous uh, applications. Depending on what the previous crop was and how it was managed, you may need to add some fertility, primarily nitrogen. We think about phosphorus as being less mobile, and so you're often applying that with your crop, but it may be an opportunity to get that phosphorus application on with your drill with the cover crop. But uh, more often than not, that will be applied in the cropping phase of the rotation. 
Nitrogen, though, if you really want to build some dry matter or if you're planning on grazing it fairly aggressively and you've had, a, say, an outstanding wheat crop or a, if you're following a corn crop that likely utilized a lot of the nitrogen, well, maybe you need to think about, you know, 30 to 50 pounds of nitrogen just to stimulate that initial growth and get the crop up and going. Yeah, the soil test may well pay off here. Uh, so profile great. soil test, see what you've got. You can make some assumptions based on previous yields. You know, if it was a failed crop and you had a good in rate out there, well, maybe you don't want to use nitrogen. Maybe you want to use the cover crop to recover what's in that profile out there or something like that. So a lot of things go into that. I tend to view the cover crop as a way to scavenge and capture what's out there. But if you really want some production out of that, primarily nitrogen is the element we think about as being most limiting in this scenario. But if you have an indication that you're very low phosphorus, yes, that could be important. Sulfur is becoming more and more important, although, uh, again, that's typically addressed in the uh, grain crop portion of the rotation. Regarding seeding rates, that's, uh, again, uh, something that you almost have to feel your way through. It much depends on the components of the mixture, but, you know, a lot of the small grain seeding rates, if you're either a sole small grain or the combination of small grains, it's going to, we'll recommend a seeding rate similar to what you would for a grain establishment to maybe higher, and especially as you move later and later into your right. planting date, your seeding rates, you're going to want to push that up just to get that initial ground cover and the initial growth. You'll have less tillering. If you combine different species, you need to back off the individual rates. You don't just keep adding 60 pounds of a small grain. No, you back off proportionately. If you want to emphasize one component over another, well, maybe you, let's say you're combining uh, some small grain grasses with brassicas, well, maybe you want to really back off the grasses because they tend to have a little more vigorous seedlings compared to the brassicas. And uh, the brassicas are typically only seeded at a pound or two, depending on how many are in the mix. You know, the whole total brassica component could be three or four species, might only add up to three or four pounds of that seeding rate, and sometimes only a couple of pounds. Uh, and so if you don't want the small grain to kind of dominate that. You need to back that off accordingly to, to leave room for those brassicas or the clovers to, to establish. So you need to think this through quite a bit, right. don't you? <laughs> right. We've been talking largely about cover crops as a forage producer, but if one's objective, primary objective is soil building, what do they absolutely need to include in that mixture? Or what do they need to concentrate on solely as a single cover crop? I don't know that I can point to an individual species to say, boy, this is what you need to include. I think anything you're using in the grazing mixtures can have soil building characteristics. If you're really going for uh, an organic matter, you know, trying to build your, your organic matter portion of the soil, you need to have some kind of a grass in there. Okay. Have a little more persistent residue that will start cycling into the uh the organic matter portion. It takes time and several crops, but the brassicas, the legumes, they cycle very quickly. They build residue or they build the soil primarily by cycling the nitrogen, keeping it in the active pools and helping to cycle the carbon and moving that carbon from residue into the more persistent organic matter components. And so they are important as well. And so, as I mentioned earlier, if next year you're planning to plant soybeans, I would go heavier on the small grains, those kinds of things. Cereal rye very common in some areas and as a proven track record as being a very nice way to suppress winter annual weeds and make a nice no-till seed bed for a, a soybean. If you're going to corn, maybe you want something that cycles a little quicker so that that ground is more receptive to an early planting date. Sorghum as well. And even though you're planting it later, you don't want too much of those high CDN residues out there tying up nitrogen 
even though that residue is on the surface, uh, some of our work has shown that the root systems below there uh, will, I don't know if it ties it up necessarily, but it takes a little time for it to cycle back out of that. And so you, you need to manage with a starter fertilizer and your sorghum those, or corn to get that off to a nice start. And so you go heavier on the brassicas or the winter annual legumes, things like that. Well, a slew of considerations, <laughs> obviously. Producers need to process all of these, and K-State has been actively researching cover crop options for several years now, and you would advise producers to tap into that information out there, right? That's right. Uh, John Holman out in southwest Kansas has looked at it in those production systems for the past few years. Augustine Ober at Hayes is looking at cover crops and including grazing components. Uh, Gretchen Sassenrath is looking at it, and, and Doug Shoup in southeast Kansas, and many others that I'm neglecting to mention, uh, many from the animal science side. They're gaining more localized knowledge and, and information for that. A number of the seed companies who supply the seed have great expertise and have gained experience as well. And a lot of producers have been utilizing them for for quite some time. And as I said, primarily, my impression is still grazing is one of the main drivers. And but there are producers out there looking at straight up cover crops, and and they have a nice fit and are making them work. If you'd like to, again. Access K-State agronomy information on cover crop production and all of the considerations that go into it. You can start by inquiring through your local Extension Agricultural agent, and they can steer you in the proper direction to find out more. Craig, it's a highly interesting topic for a lot of producers out there, cover crop establishment in the fall. We appreciate this overview. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Glad to do it. Cropping Systems Agronomist out of the Department of Agronomy at K-State. Craig Rosabom, and you're listening to Agriculture Today. We'll be back after this break over the K-State Radio Network. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. This Agriculture Today continues now telling you about a special project that agricultural economists here at Kansas State University are involved with in promoting food initiatives in one particular part of Africa, and specifically the country of Ghana. Along with us now is K-State agricultural economist Jakob Zariesis. Jakob, this is sponsored by the U.S. Agency for International Development. What is this all about, this initiative? Yeah, this initiative, there is this, uh, you know, U.S. government's global food security initiative, which is known as the Feed the Future. So as part of this program, which is currently under implementation in 19 countries around the world, in which has 12 of them are in Africa, and, and Ghana is one of them. So our METS program provides the monitoring and evaluation support to track you know, the achievement and the progress of this uh, huge uh, program in northern Ghana. So you're quantifying the achievements of the program, in effect, yes. which is a, a tall order. This is yeah. this includes collecting significant data. What are the stated objectives of the program? Clearly, it's to uh, lead to food stability in that area of the world, right? Yeah. So, uh, as you said, you know, it's that uh, northern you know region of Ghana is relatively has higher prevalence of poverty and hunger, as well as higher rates of malnutrition as compared to the rest of the country. Mm. And so what our program does is it tries to provide progress in terms of numbers. So in 2012, for example, we collected the first round of population-based data to put the baseline indicators. 
And so we documented that data set in 2012. In 2015, three three years later, uh, we also collected data from the same population to track the progress of the implementation of the, you know, program activities. So you were looking at such variables as the common food resources utilized by that population and other mechanisms of their food system? What? Yes. Uh, in general, there are about 11 uh, what they call high-level indicators. For example, the prevalence of poverty, uh, the uh, per capita expenditure in terms of the income uh, level of the population, and some other health and nutrition indicators, such as the, for example, anthropometric indicators in children and women. For example, if you take a given uh, individual household, we collect data from almost everybody in the household, from uh, health and nutrition indicators up to the all sorts of uh, expenses they they do in terms of food, in terms of their, uh, you know, expense in education, almost everything that is uh, out there to help us understand their uh, expenditure levels. That's what makes this a huge undertaking. It's a very huge undertaking. Yeah. Yeah. Have you and your colleagues, Jakob, detected progress in the years since this has been initiated since 2012? Yeah, actually, yeah. When when we did our interim population survey, uh, actually the the poverty uh, level and the level of stunting in in children actually declined. Hmm. We are still in the process of uh, updating and reviewing the results and data, but uh, the preliminary results show that uh, actually there is progress uh, happening. So that's encouraging. That's very encouraging. Yeah. Yeah. You and your associates are about to head back to Ghana to continue the data collection, correct? Yeah, yes. So what, what we are going to do normally, that's what we do, is we, we go through a rigorous planning process in order to eventually implement the data collection uh, effectively. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, next month we, we're going to go to uh, Ghana to do the, the planning and preparation process engage stakeholders and put everybody together on the same page and prepare for the, you know, the last uh, survey that's going to happen in 2018. This is among other things that uh, we're going to... Are there things associated with the project? Yeah, or? With, you know, like all the details of the planning process mm-hmm. and, okay. and, and everything, yes. Excellent. It's likely rewarding to be part of this initiative and pulling together the information that indicate success by and large. So that's the payoff for you and your colleagues, right? Yes, yes, that's yeah. true. Yeah, and uh, it, it helps, you know, when you find uh, some level of progress. Uh, the, the challenge is trying to uh, attribute whatever progress to the programs, but uh, these kind of activities help you to document and provide evidence base for, you know, uh, decision-making and uh, designing policies. And, you know, one of the good aspects of such data collection process, when we collect the data from uh, our program, the U.S. government decided to put it open access for everybody to use. So, for example, the 2012 data is already out for everybody to use it. So if you go to uh, data.gov, you can find all the data set from our data collection and use it to to do, you know, uh, all sorts of uh, interesting results. Could provide guidance for similar initiatives at other locations around the world then, right? Yes, yes. You you, you could also use the data to provide uh, explanations to uh, all sorts of economic uh, issues. Mm -hmm. Uh, We've been doing that uh, on top of our, uh, you know, data collection and monitoring and evaluation uh, activities. We are also heavily engaged in doing some data uh, supported research. So over the years, we've been trying to look at, uh, for example, uh, the factors that affect poverty, the income level, the uh, health in women and children. It provides a whole uh, range of resources to conduct research and understand, you know, what's going on in 
trying to achieve the overall or the sustainable reduction of uh, poverty hunger in, in the area. To that end, hopefully addressing poverty issues not only in Ghana but elsewhere as this whole Feed the Future initiative is a global endeavor to be sure. Jakob, thanks for telling us about the project and your role in it. And as you head back to that country, the best of luck in further gathering important information on this subject. Thank you, Eric. Jakob Zariesis, our guest on this part of agriculture today. He is an agricultural economist at the university and involved in this U.S. Agency for International Development project in Ghana, where they are tracking information on that project's efforts to address poverty issues and uh, nutrition issues along with that within that country. You're listening to Agriculture Today, and we'll be back shortly on the K-State Radio Network. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. This is our state, Kansas. The average daylily is so hard to kill that it may one day become the symbol of abandoned or the overgrown gardens. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. He held the delicate yellow daylily flower carefully in his hand, admiring its beauty. Then suddenly he ripped the flower petals apart, put them in his mouth, chewed, and swallowed them. Good eating, he said. The average daylily is so hard to kill that it may one day become the symbol of abandoned or the overgrown gardens. The statement came to my mind when I drove by an old farmhouse along Route 59, south of Lawrence, going to Ottawa. The old farmhouse stood west of the road. You couldn't see much of the lower part as tall weeds had taken over the yard. A large pine tree stood as a sentinel in front of the gray, unpainted, weather-beaten house. As I drove by, my eyes caught a glimpse of orange in the otherwise weedy green yard. It was just a glimpse, but with the sun setting lower in the west, the lightfall made the orange with backlighting stand out even more. I had passed it before I really realized what I had seen, but when I saw it, I turned around and pulled off the road and turned back to take a closer look. I sensed that the orange color was from daylilies, which had taken over the yard of the old abandoned farmhouse. I pulled up in the yard and stepped out in the tall grass. What once must have been a small slip of daylilies had become a dense, large, overgrown, beautiful patch of naturalized orange daylilies. I gingerly stepped among the perimeter of brightly orange and took a few photos. The orange flowers with their slender leaves stood out against the gray, weathered wood. A hinged green window slowly moved in the breeze. It was too light to be eerie, but in the evening, with the moon out and an owl hooting in the old pine, the eking window would have made one wonder what kind of spell was over this empty house and enchanted, overgrown yard. In the southern part of the state, the daylilies have been blooming now for a couple of weeks. By selecting particular cultivars, one can have bloom, well, from May until October. But the ones I was looking at were the old-fashioned orange ones, which you can see everywhere, 
and which you can't get rid of. The daylilies are so blooming around the old house where the old, tawny daylilies, Hemericalis vulva, Europe. I have an affinity for this old, often weedy cultivar. My fondness for this old cultivar is based on the many odd places I have seen it grow in the landscape. It's in the landscape setting that I enjoy it. On our farm, it's grown near the old burned-down farmhouse. I've dug many tubers of it and gave them to the children, and I've always been amazed how the plant took off once giving a new lease on life. The old tawny daylilies, the orange one, do not produce any seed, so you know that wherever you see them grow, they were planted by someone or dumped with a load of soil. Nearly every part of the daylily has been used for food. The flower buds have been harvested for green vegetables. The flowers dried, added to soup. The tubers on the roots have been eaten and lower portions of the spring leaves have been used as a salad green. It's an interesting plant with a long history of gardening. Today, for the daylily fancier, there are literally thousands of cultivars to choose from. The late Dr. Stout of the New York Botanical Gardens introduced countless numbers of new selections with new color shadings, petal formation, and sizes. They are available in the trade. It's obvious daylilies are easy to grow and the plants multiply freely. They like full sun or partial shade. The latter location is good for pastel colors which fade in the sun. They grow best in good, well-drained, loamy soils, but I've seen them do equally well on poor, wet sites. High fertility leads to tall growth and poor flowering. And what cannot be said for many plants, they have root systems which will compete with tree roots. The large clumps with erect flower stems should be divided in fall or spring every four to six years. The new plants should be separated into root segments, each with three or four shoots. If the fibrous roots are too tangled, a sharp spade will make a clean cut. Those dailies which produce seed may be easily increased by sowing the seed in the open ground in June or July. It generally takes up two to three years before the new plants will bloom. Because most of the garden varieties are hybridized, the new plants may vary from the parent. Daylilies are effective as clumps in flower borders or naturalized. As I said, they are easy to grow and not bothered much by insects. Wind might flatter them down, but even then, They seem to stand up again, and with their flowers only blooming one day, a washed-out bloom will only last a short while before another takes its place. The old Greeks called the daylily, which is native to China, Europe, and Japan, hemerocallus, which means beautiful for a day. Daylilies. They're blooming across Kansas. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on rural Kansas. Our time's away for today. Thanks for listening in. Eric Atkinson here for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.